May we now welcome Captain Shankar over, over the stage for the next talk, please. So, Captain Shankar graduated in the year 1988 from Armed Forces Medical College, Pune. After that, he completed his MD and then DNB 1996, and uh, he obtained a fellowship in clinical immunology in 2005 from the esteemed All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Having been a professor of in internal medicine in the Armed, Med uh, Armed Forces Medical College, Pune, he joined Command Hospital Air Force, Bangalore, as a senior advisor of medicine and clinical immunology in July 2014. A very keen academician, he is the editor-in-chief of Indian Journal of Rheumatology since June 2009 and has been uh, till May 2013. He is a reviewer of many uh, various international journals. He has many awards and honors to his name. And uh, finally, he has about 15, 59 publications. And uh, more than everything, I think he's our favorite quiz master. Over to you, Dr. Shankar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chetna. <coughs> no, uh, when Dr. Chandrasekhar said that he has got his teacher sitting in the audience, so I looked and I'm, I'm proud to say that my professor, Brigadier Kasturi sir, is also here, even though I did it from Puda. So, thank you, sir. Dr. Dharmanand has actually made my job extremely easy because he told uh, so much about methotrexate and now I just have to compare and contrast the other two drugs and I think it will actually form a good template. I bring to you greetings from uh, Command Hospital. This is a government hospital where I work and uh, I'm a practicing rheumatologist. We so if you, let's go back to what exactly is a DMR. So Dr. Chandrasheva already said it but just to reiterate if a disease has proved to stop or at least delay joint destruction in rheumatoid arthritis, in that case, it can qualify itself as a DMR. This is very important. You have the conventional or classical DMRs about which this entire conference is about on methotrexate, sulfasalazine, hydroxychloroquine, leflunomide, cyclophosphamide, cyclosporin, gold, all these are the conventional or classical biologics which we are not discussing about and interestingly steroids too especially when given in combination with conventional classic DMRs they also behave like a DMR themselves not alone but when given in combination and it is in this subgroup that I shall be talking about sulfasalazine and hydroxychloroquine. A broad overview all the classical DMRs are effective in rheumatoid arthritis, all of them. All of them have got, most of them actually have got a fair efficacy in peripheral spondyloarthropathy. That is spondyloarthropathy with just affecting the large joint like knees, ankles, etc. Slightly less effective than rheumatoid. And almost none of them have got an efficacy in pure axial spondyloarthritis. So, Having said that, 40% of all axial patients in the West land up getting sulfasalazine or methotrexate and possibly a higher percentage in India land up getting it. But that is a controversial subject. But having, I think this is just a thumb rule that rheumatoid good, peripheral SPA fair, axial SPA not enough evidence or it is more or less very little. Coming down to sulfasalazine, Way back in 1930s, this Swedish rheumatologist called Dr. Nanna Swartz, she developed this molecule called sulfasalazine for what she thought was for that time infective arthritis. That's because I'll come to the next slide, the component. In fact, uh, uh, sir mentioned about Professor Subarao. I think that was the era when people were told you must develop a molecule. So, Professor Subarao's professor that time had told him that he wanted a molecule which would inhibit the proliferation of lymphoma cells in mice. So, he developed aminopterin and amithopterin, which eventually aminopterin went on to become your methotrexate. So, uh, I wonder how people would you know, invent molecules, but Dr. Nana Swartz, she developed uh, sulfasalazine. And if you look at it, the reason she looked at the infective arthritis was that sulfasalazine has got two components, one which is anti-inflammatory and the second which is an antibiotic. That is the acetyl salicylic acid which is nothing more than the plain and simple and humble aspirin and sulfapyridine 
So she was actually thinking that maybe the infection will get sorted out. The infection, I don't think anything much occurred, but then we got a fantastic drug which we later used for rheumatoid arthritis. How does it act in rheumatoid arthritis? The simple answer is we don't know. When Dr. Dharmanan uh, told you about methotrexate, we seem to know a lot about how methotrexate acts, that is through your adenosine, ICAR pathway and all that stuff. Honestly, for sulfur salicin, we don't know how it acts. But having said that, people have done studies and sh shown that there is some inhibition of various cytokine release like interleukin 1, 2, 6, 12, TNF alpha. There is inhibition of various transcription factors, but it, we, we are not really sure. All we know is it works and we are very happy about that. When you take sulfa salazine, which is, can only be given in an oral route, just about 10 to 30 percent gets absorbed. Almost all of it lands up going to the large gut. In the gut, the bacteria, they land up breaking up into the two moieties, the sulfa pyridine and the acetyl salicylic acid, which gets absorbed and it is this one which is actually responsible for your effect. How do you start the dose? Just like, of course, methotrexate you start straight away, you can start at different levels, various strategies which has been mentioned, but in sulfur salazine, you are actually a little bit more conservative. You start at a low dose, something as low possibly as even 500 milligram once a day, and then eventually you land up reaching it up to 2 to 3 grams, depending upon the body weight of the individual. Just like all other DMRs, here, whether it is methotrexate or sulfa salazine or hydroxychloroquine, all of it takes anything between 6 to 8 or sometimes even 12 weeks to have its maximal effect. How good is sulfa salazine in rheumatoid arthritis? I mean, is it as good as methotrexate? So, they, I just thought I'll, I'll give a little bit of a data. So, the, the largest one is a meta-analysis which looked at six uh, randomized control trials with almost just short of 500 patients. All these trials had compared sulfa salazine with placebo. The initial, nowadays, you cannot do a trial comparing with placebo, it would be unethical. But at that time, when we are trying to prove somewhere in the 80s and the early 90s, whether it is good or not, obviously you are comparing with placebos. So, it showed a benefit in every domain, improvement in tender joint count, swollen joint scores, which in the afternoon we shall be discussing how to go about doing it, in the pain, in acute phase reactions like ESR, but compared to placebo, there were higher withdrawals also. What it means was there are obviously some side effects which the patients of sulfa salazine were getting, which placebo was not getting. So it stands to be that it's a, it's a pretty good drug. So next question which we can ask is, okay, it's good, better than a placebo. How does it stand against methotrexate, which we all know is the backbone? So, actually three trials have been done which have done a head-to-head -head comparison, almost again under 500 participants. The good news is it's, it's as good. Efficacy wise, it's almost as good as methotrexate. But if you land up look, looking at it, Dr. Dharmanan has already told you that methotrexate is a hero when it lands up coming at, this, at a period of 12 years, almost 50% of the people are still taking methotrexate, sulfur salazine in this uh, matter actually loses out. So, if you are going to be following up at even at 5 years, only about 20 to 30 percent of sulfur salazine people may be continuing. Because what occurs is even the efficacy may be the same. Like the thumb rule to remember is methotrexate, sulfur salazine, lefronamide, all of them are roughly of same efficacy. But it is not only a matter of efficacy which determines how long you can take the medicine, it is also how well you are able to tolerate. And in tolerance, methotrexate beats everyone hands down. How do these three combine with against each other, methotrexate versus alpha salazine versus lefronamide? A systematic review was done which came in 2008. It showed what I told you just now, roughly same efficacy and roughly no duration of adverse effects. But the problem in these studies is that they did not look at such a large duration. They have looked at a small duration of two years or something and said, hey, all of them are roughly similar. But the, with time, methotrexate starts showing its uh, superiority. So we know that sulfa salazine is a pretty good drug in rheumatoid arthritis and matches up with uh, uh, methotrexate, but the side effects catch up over a period of time. So let's see how good is sulfa salazine in another uh, disease like ankylosing spondylitis or spondyloarthropathy. So there have been two Cochrane reviews 
uh, done in 2005 and 14. Interestingly, both of them analyzed the same 11 studies by the same gentleman Chen et al. The reason was I do not think there was any new RCT which came up, they just reanalyzed the data and looked at it in a different way. What they found was vis-a-vis -vis placebo, it only improved the ESR and early morning stiffness. There was actually no significant improvement in pain, that is why they ran the, this thing. Two trials did show, with, but both the trials which had been done of relatively shorter duration of less than 6 years showed there was some improvement in pain, in mobility and patient's well-being, but 9 trials did not show this effect. So therefore, by and large, the thumb rule is that if sulfasalazine, however, in peripheral arthritis like I mentioned in the first slide itself, it is pretty okay. So, if you have a person of spondylarthropathy with peripheral arthritis, sulfasalazine is good drug, but the current recommendations land up telling that in peripheral arthritis, yes, in axial spondyloarthropathy, it is no. Uh, many of us rheumatologists here have got, you know, a lot of other issues which are not purely scientific with this recommendation, but this is what is the current level of evidence. And this is just uh, the uh, level of evidence of sulfasalazine versus methotrexate in both the disease. It is actually again, I just, whatever I have put, I just put in the form of a table, you can just skip the slide. How good is sulfasalazine in a third disease called psoriatic arthritis? Two drugs have been shown to be pretty good in psoriatic arthritis, especially when it affects the peripheral joints and sulfasalazine and interestingly even in even though it is methotrexate, but it was the parenteral methotrexate which was found to be pretty good, oral was found to be less efficacious and I just, I think this is a little poor uh, quality print, but this is the your meta-analysis which lands up showing that sulfasalazine is good. The next question which comes is that okay, sulfasalazine by itself is pretty good in rheumatoid, in uh, uh, peripheral involvement in spondylarthropathy and psoriatic arthropathy. How well does it combine with the backbone methotrexate? So, actually speaking, when you use the word combination therapy, we are actually talking about combining classical DMRs. A combination of steroid, NSAIDs or biologic does not use, the, the word combination is not used there. So, in patients with early rheumatoid arthritis, combination therapy, these trials have clearly shown, is better than any of the drug alone in a response rates, radiographic changes, functional capacity, stands to logic that okay, uh, a dr one drug alone is not good, essentially you are able to get the inflammation down better. So, combination is, is pretty good. Three landmark trials, FINRACO, COBRA and BEST study, all of them are showing that combination therapy in various combination, methotrexate plus sulfasalazine plus HCQ, methotrexate plus sulfasalazine, whichever one, by and large the combination beats uh, the single drug, especially if the inflammation is active. To the extent that now there are enough trials, especially the landmark one which came in 2013 NEGM, which actually now is giving it a, a competition to biologics. And now it's, uh, there was the last 10 years, biologics suddenly had come up in a big way. But what has occurred now is that there is enough data coming that these three humble people, methotrexate, sulfasalazine, hydroxychloroquine, used intelligently with a judicious use of steroids can give a run for the money to uh, biologicals which are almost possibly 50 to 100 times more priced. So, I think there is uh, and that is why again this debate has started coming back in various conferences. So, that is ok in, in early arthritis and this thing is fine. So, how well would sulfasalazine deal in methotrexate failures especially in patients of rheumatoid? So, again this, this is the article which I was referring to Odell et al. He looked at a combination of methotrexate, sulfasalazine, hydroxychloroquine plus placebo etanercept and here he gave methotrexate, etanercept and placebo of sulfasalazine hydroxychloroquine and he said they are equal. That is really nice at the end of 2 years. So, considering the cost if this thing, of course, in the adverse effect this group did have a little bit more but none of the serious ones. So, that is what I said is the controversy which is coming back again. We know that sulfasalazine is not able to match up to methotrexate because of the side effects. So, what are the side effects which we are really worried about? The common ones which you get are basically GI intolerance which is shared with methotrexate also some nausea, abdominal pain, you get a little wooziness, headache, dizziness, sometimes you get a rash. 
if you give an entry coated formulation it actually reduces if a person is having tumor of GI it might reduce the GI side effects. The rarer ones are things like leukopenia, reversible oligospermia in male patients, hypersensitivity reaction, liver enzymes elevation almost similar to methotrexate, very rarely a bone marrow suppression etc. But almost about 30 percent of the patients may at the end of a year or two may stop sulfa salazine because of not lack of efficacy but because of side effects and in the initial stages you do uh, uh, after the first one month you can shift over to three monthly monitoring and the monitoring which follows in sulfa salazine exactly mimics methotrexate which makes life pretty easy. So, you, you, you keep giving the same instruction to the patient. Now, the good news is it safe in pregnancy? So, we have had a large observation studies almost going up to 400 people. This was the sulfa salicin here was given for inflammatory bowel disease, but the logic still holds. These are all women were pregnant, and interestingly, there was no association between any structural defects and prenatal exposure to sulfa salicin. So, the FTS approved it is a safe in pregnancy and also in lactation. So, one word it is a nice and safe drug. So, if you are going to have a pregnant female, see the good news about pregnancy in rheumatoid is in almost 70 to 80 percent of the cases, the disease itself will go into a remission or at least come down to a low activity. So, that is a great news already. So, you are already in a one upmanship here over the disease. And then if a person is already on methotrexate, a smart thing to stop it and possibly give sulfa salazine and you know you can easily go through the pregnancy. Once the delivery is over the disease is likely to come back, but then at least the challenge is not there of the pregnancy. So, to summarize sulfa salazine before I come to hydroxychloroquine, it is effective in rheumatoid, peripheral spondyloarthropathy and psoriatic arthritis. It is good as a single agent or as it combines very well with methotrexate in both early RA and also in methotrexate failures. And the most important side effects are just ordinary GI side effects. Coming down to hydroxychloroquine, it was realized some time ago that the humble chloroquine which we used to give for malaria did land up having some disease modifying effect. But when you gave it on a long term basis, some side effects would come. So, the hydroxychloroquine was developed which was actually less on side effects and was found to be useful for treatment of various inflammatory arthritis. What occurs is, occurs is that this gets concentrated inside the cells, increases the intracellular pH and it interferes the cells ability to degrade and process proteins. The dose is about 200 milligram, you give it 200 to 400 milligram per day. Again like all other DMRs, the onset of action is about anything from 6 to 12 weeks and it, it does land up causing skin hyperpigmentation and some hypersensitivity. So, some people may be this thing. So, if you go to the details of how it acts, a little bit more is known about HCQS than sulfa salazine. You know that it does affect the innate immunity by acting on the tone like receptors. It blocks the co stimulation of B cell antigen receptor and TLR9 pathway. It has got a lysosomotropic effect and it also decreases some of the pro inflammatory cytokines, especially TH17 related cytokines. How good is hydroxychloroquine in rheumatoid arthritis? A thumb rule, methotrexate, sulfa salazine, lefronamide are up here, hydroxychloroquine is somewhere lower down, little lesser than them. It is actually, can you use it as a single drug? I think if the disease is pretty mild, it is not a bad choice. You can use it especially in early RA. But if it is moderate disease, then it actually becomes a very good drug to combine with. It, it combines well with any of the other three. So, it is it's a very good drug as a part of a double or a triple drug regimen. Very few of our patients are likely to be on HCQS alone. In addition to rheumatoid, HCQS is a, it's a backbone of treatment of lupus, which is again a, a inflammatory condition where it, it not only lands up improving the skin joint and constant symptoms, but the most important is prevents clinical relapse of the disease. It ameliorates nephritis. For example, if you are going to give mycophenolate mofetil for lupus nephritis, the efficacy increases the, uh, the better rates of remission. It decreases the thromboembolic events and also has mortality benefit. It is been shown to have beneficial effect on xerostomia in Jogren's. So, the common side effects are just some ordinary rash. Skin hyperpigmentation is something which we see quite commonly. 
some diarrhea and the patients may have affection of the eye, it is a rare complication. The, 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 this is something which is actually usually makes it for a good multiple choice question also, the famous bullseye maculopathy. But the important thing to remember is that it is usually asymptomatic and rare, but one needs the people who take a higher dose that is more than 6.5 milligram per kg, elderly people and who have coexisting renal and hepatic dysfunction, these are the people who are more predisposed for this eye complication. So it is a good idea to do a baseline monitoring where and every 5 years especially if you are less than 60 years and then every year after baseline 5 years every year thereafter this is the recommendation. HCQS has got a one more good benefit beneficial effect, it, it actually has got a uh, complementary effect on the lipid profile. So, so they say that it not only does methotrexate someone said is it the new statin, there is a competitor already here in the form of hydroxychloroquine. This study showed that given the increased CVD risks in RA and relatively low cost of HCQS, they went on to say that maybe you should add HCQS in everyone, if not for the arthritis at least for the heart. But that is of course a different thing, but having said that it has got a pretty good effect on the lipid profile and it, this is another drug which is pretty safe in pregnancy and lactation. So Dr. Chandrasekhar has chosen the two drugs which I am supposed to speak about that is your sulfasalazine and hydroxychloroquine which are both good in pregnancy and lactation, I think you can remember it that way. So to conclude, sulfasalazine and hydroxychloroquine are actually two excellent drugs in inflammatory arthritis and connective tissue disorders. Both of them have got a pretty good efficacy, HCQ is slightly less than the sulfa salazine. They have got modest side effects, they combine well in various permutation combination with other drugs and both of them are pretty safe in pregnancy and lactation. This is, uh, I just put two websites for your patient information, I think this is easy to, you know I tried to make it blue but it is refusing to come, so it is arthritisresearchuk.org. So it is just one word arthritis research uk dot org, I found it is a pretty good site, another is room info that is rheumatology room info dot com. So you could just land up uh, you know patients sometimes those who are interested in going to the uh, internet might as well go to that website which you want them to see and thank you and I would be happy to handle any questions. Thank you Dr. Shankar, uh, we will be able to take one question because of short of time. Uh, there is no questioning. Only thing is, Honorable Speaker, I am extremely jealous of you because after your name, lot of alphabets are there. That is one point to become. I am jealous of you. Second point is, the, the speech was like a, a pendulum hitting the bell in Westminster Abbey. So it is hitting our brains that can so nicely it was. And also Margaret Thatcher's speech I hear, I think it is just like uh, your speech is like that. And, uh, so thank you, my God bless you. The one thing is. So one minute. I'm honoured on all the three <laughs> accounts. <sir. laughs> uh, 1917 lupus made out these anti-malarials. Till 1967, Bagnall was the person. I don't know how long, how exactly he introduced this uh, chloramphenicol. Anti-malarial and rheumatoid arthritis is a point to be thought of. Uh, I actually did not go to the history of when it got introduced. I don't know whether you know often. I no, 19, so it was. Uh, he, he saw that the rheumatoid arthritis pain comes down in the palliative patients. Oh. So that's why he just took a chance to. Uh, in the uh, okay, thank you very much. Sir. God bless you. Yes. One question about Harish. Chikungunya arthritis. Uh, why literature mentions chloroquine over HCQs? So, in fact, uh, Dr. Arvind Chopra has just delivered the plenary yes. lecture at uh, ACR. Uh, ACR in front of 4,500 people on chikungunya arthritis. I think he is the best person to answer this question. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe some other time we'll have a discussion on chikungunya. It's a very important problem. Let me give you three. Uh, sort of points on uh, based on our research data. Uh, chloroquine is not effective in the anti-malarial dose in patients with acute chikungunya illness, number one. Number two, we did a six month study, randomized control study. Six months study in patients who had uh, arthritis 
and rheumatism because there are joint problems and soft tissue immediately following chikungunya illness. So our inclusion was within six weeks. Significant amount of pain, ESR. We took those patients in a village situation, in a community setting, and we did a six-month study comparing chloroquine to meloxicam because I could give it once a day. And it's published in arthritis rheumatism. At the end of six months, no advantage of chloroquine. Including we did cytokines, we could not find. I was very keen to do this because the sales of chloroquine post chikungunya epidemic have gone up three times. <laughs> and I was talking to my friend Mahindranath that in the souvenir sir, in the indications of hydroxychloroquine, I, I told Shankar in fact, the farm has started writing chikungunya arthritis. And I said that's only because of you, because you got it to the world I now. I told him I have nothing to do with it, I am not getting anything out of it. But my third point is to be taken also, I would say, uh, consider that patients who have now inflammatory arthritis following chikungunya and persisting, a picture which could be similar to rheumatoid or seronegative, and I think we all see such patients after four months, six months, we don't have evidence either to support chloroquine or condemn chloroquine. Personally, I do give chloroquine disease situations and treat them just like other autoimmune inflammatory disorders. Though I have proposed that post chikungunya rheumatism arthritis is not an autoimmune disorder. It's due to a persistent virus. So let me just give these comments. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think with that, we conclude the first session of uh, Chandra Abdo 2015. Uh, I thank Dr. Chandrasekhar sir for giving us this opportunity to take this first session and uh, the second session that is the inaugural function will now follow. I would like to thank both the chairpersons and the speakers for their valuable input. Now I request Dr. Nagaraj to hand over the momento to, uh, to group captain Shankar. Now I request Dr. Chetna to hand over the momentum to Dr. Dharmananda. Okay. Okay, I request Dr. Chetna to hand over the momentum to Dr. Chandrasekhar. Now I request Dr. Renuka to hand over the momentum to our chairpersons, Dr. Nagraj. I also request Dr. Renuka to hand over the moment to Dr. Chetna.